on page 32 in the front part of the red hymnal. O Lord, open thou my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me.
brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been according to me, by Chloe's people, that, those, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel appointed for this day comes from Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. This also is the basis for our sermon this morning. When Jesus heard that John had been rested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region, in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Here ends our gospel lesson. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Congregation may be seated. At this time, I would invite any children who are present to come forward for the children's message. I thought it was kind of cool. 
Because not only does it have a really bright light, I mean, look at that, that thing shines on, you can see it on the ceiling. And then if you uh, didn't want to use up all the power, you just push it twice. And see, it's, 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 uh, it's not as bright a light, it saves the battery power. This particular flashlight it has this cool thing when you press it three times. One, two, three. It blinks. Now, why would you need a blinking light? It's a warning light. Like, let's say you were stopped by the side of the road and your car was there and it was dark and somebody could come and hit you. If you put that light up, they'd say, oh, there's a flashing light. Don't go over there. Be careful. So it's kind of warning people. I think when Jesus comes and he says, I am the light of the world, he's telling people that A, you don't have to be scared of the dark because he'll take care of us. But he also warns us about things that can hurt us, like sin and death. He says, you don't have to be afraid of those. Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and he says, I give you the victory. You don't have to worry about those things. I will always be with you. I will always protect you. Watch over you. So, when we hear about Jesus being the light, I hope we always remember that you don't have to be afraid anymore. Oh yeah, I, mean, I still turn on the lights when it's dark or if it's dark outside. I want to be careful. But I don't have to be afraid because I know God's with me. And this talks about when Jesus started his ministry and when he talks about the light. How he's the light. You can go back to your seats and we will continue with our next hymn.
Dear friends in Christ Jesus, in my sophomore year of college, I was able to go on the Rocky Mountain field trip offered by Concordia Ann Arbor over Easter break as part of my major in natural science. Probably the only guy at Ann Arbor who went to seminary with a major in natural science. One of the places we went was a side trip to the Onondaga Cavern in Missouri. Now as part of the tour, the guide wanted to get a, us to get a feel of what it was like to be without light. He gave us fair warning. It was about to get dark, real dark. We were over 100 feet below ground and there was no way a speck of light that wasn't produced artificially could make it to where we were. The lights installed in the cave were switched off and we endured several seconds of paralyzing, oppressive, all-encompassing, couldn't see your hand in front of your face darkness. No one dared move. Someone started to breathe a little fast and the guy immediately flicked on his butane lighter. The one <coughs> flickering flame seemed to provide as much light as the electric lights had before. That, that little glowing light made everyone breathe a sigh of relief. One of the guys in my group asked the guy, what would you have done if you had dropped your lighter in the total darkness? The guy slyly revealed that he still had his hand on the switch, just in case. And he turned the lights back on. A memorable demonstration. But can we really be comforted by the promise of artificial light? We live with plenty of frightening darkness, whether it's day or night. The darkness in our daily lives comes despite the sun coming out in the morning. We can't escape it. And no man-made light can shine it away. Because sin has come into the world, and with it brings spiritual darkness, and death. And yet there is hope. Epiphany, so it's telling the kids, is all about light appearing. This light, to quote from John's Gospel, this light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Unlike any artificial light, the promised light of Jesus Christ rescues us from the daily darkness of death with the endless light of eternal life. The reality of this hope is what the Apostle Matthew tried to convey to his readers back then, as well as his readers today. The light of Christ burst upon our dark world. This light was promised long ago by Isaiah the prophet. We see his prophecy in today's Old Testament lesson. A prophecy on my dad that was made nearly eight hundred years before the birth of Christ. The tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, the northern part of Israel, lived in the darkness of trouble and oppression by foreign kings. See, they were the closest ones to the enemy, and so consequently they were the closest ones to the action. This area became known as Galilee of the Gentiles, and that was no compliment. Many had been transported there from pagan lands. Even the Jews of Galilee were scorned by the more fashionable and literate religious establishment down south in Jerusalem. The context of our gospel lesson is that Jesus withdrew to Galilee after hearing of John the Baptist's arrest. Galilee was, after all, his home territory though he first appeared on the scene down south where John was preaching. Now he returned to Galilee in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Thus Jesus becomes the light seen by those sitting in the darkness of where he grew up. The, the practical application of this to us is that Jesus shines on our current culture of death too. See, our modern world tries to overcome darkness with hope. 
that is false, hope that is only artificial life. I was thinking back to last Sunday, for example, when we observed Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and of how life has become so devalued in our modern society. For example, abortion is still touted as being merely a choice, just as more and more assisted suicide is considered in the same way. These things which end life are viewed as being enlightened options for women and the elderly. Life has become nothing more than doing what I want to do when I want to do it with no concern for others. This is the kind of lifestyle that is reflected on television and movies and music. To even bring up questions of whether something is right or wrong is considered antiquated and old-fashioned, like it's coming out of the dark ages, when in reality the times we are living in now are really the dark ages. The solutions of postmodern of a postmodern world in which every desire can be justified simply because I want it means that we live in a world which ignores sin and death. And when we Christians instead offer answers from Scripture, the enlightened intellectuals of our society make us feel backward, make us feel out of step and politically insensitive. Into such darkness, Jesus Christ has come to the rescue. Jesus comes with real light, God with us, and God for us, all the way to the cross. The light who is Jesus Christ calls us to live without worry or fear. Jesus begins his earthly ministry with repeating John the Baptist's words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is not a kingdom of worldly power or worldly solutions. His truly enlightened solutions are forgiveness and caring. God for us, us for others. Today's Lutheran School Sunday, and I'm so pleased to be at a congregation where the instruction of our young is such a high priority. Now certainly in our school, we, we teach all the skills that children need to live in this world. Math, English, history, science, and such. But we also teach our children skills they will need to get through this world to the next. Faith, forgiveness, prayer, salvation, and so much more. I am grateful that God placed me here in this church where our children can each day in a multitude of ways, not just in religion class or in chapel, but in a hundred different ways throughout the school day, they can learn that God is for us and that we live our lives for God and for others. Dear friends, God's kingdom is at hand, and it will endure to the end. His solutions are real and eternal, all the way to the endless light of heaven. Because of that, Jesus calls us to be his people in this kingdom. To the four new disciples, he says, I will make you fishers of men. To us, he invites, I will make you mine. And through you, I will make others mine as well. God is with us. Jesus goes before us. And we confidently follow, even through the darkness of death, we have a God of promises. And God always keeps his promises to you. Now, in this life, and in the life to come. There was a young secretary in a New York City office building who exemplified this. Christ was a personal reality in her life. And she did go and tell other people about him. In fact, she made such an impression on a sailor who visited the office building one day that he wrote a letter to her employer. He told her boss that he was a sailor and that he would be shipping out in a few hours, but that he had to share something before leaving. He related how he had come into that man's office in the morning, lonely and scared to death about sailing again. He needed to talk to someone. 
So when the girl at the desk greeted him, he asked her if she had a job for him. She said to wait briefly, and so he did. He said that maybe there, there would be a job or anything afterwards, if only a person had something to count on, worth dying for, things wouldn't be so bad. Then he related how the young woman smiled and said, it was easy. Christ is coming through, and he's worth dying for. He said he had just stared at the young woman, because she talked as if Christ were alive and were a good pal of her. In fact, he recalled he was so struck by her comments that he sort of expected Jesus to walk in the door. It was that real. He was only in the office for 10 minutes, but the brief encounter made such an impression on him that it changed him somehow. He was no longer lonely or scared. He wrote, it was as though she had said, I want to make you acquainted with my friend Jesus. You ought to get to know each other because he's going your way. I'm 19 and I never knew before that there was a God like that who would go along with a person. He said in conclusion that it didn't matter so much to him now. Even if his ship did go down, as long as there was a God like that, he had wanted to thank the girl for her help, but he didn't want her to think of him as being flip. So he asked the employer to please pass along his thanks to her. Listen to his words again. I never knew before that there was a God like that. That's the God you and I know. A God who is real and alive. A God who sends his light to rescue us from whatever darkness comes into our life. The light of Christ sustains and preserves us so that we can endure to the end. In our gospel lesson, Jesus, who is also called Emmanuel, God with us, went throughout Galilee, preaching, teaching, and healing. His ministry was to announce the forgiveness of sins, forgiveness he will earn on the cross for all people. His ministry is to save people from both their physical and spiritual afflictions. And today he comes to us, wherever we are. Even if we feel like we're living in Galilee of the Gentiles, as once dishonored, belittled people, we now boldly bear witness to the light of Jesus' mercy and grace. And we join in mutual encouragement, gathered here in God's holy house, baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, we receive life salvation, and the forgiveness of sins. We await the feast to come in our heavenly home, the endless light of eternal life. See, darkness no longer has the upper hand. We have no need of artificial light that offers shadowy results. The only true source and creator of light has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pierce what seemed to be the impenetrable darkness breaking the rod of our oppressor and pushing back all the evil that was afflicted upon us. And he will keep on doing that, Jesus will, until he comes again. You can't put a lid on that light. He is always coming to the rescue, even as he promised to be there, here with us, gathered around his word, the word which is called a lamp to our feet and a light to our path real life. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, our worship continues with the gathering of our offering. We receive it.
rise. We continue uh, the order of patents with our canticle. For our canticle this morning, we will remain standing and we will sing our next hymn, hymn number 128, brightest and best of the sons of the morning. Hymn 128. Her funeral was here 
in Trinity on Thursday, as well as a prayer for our school on Lutheran School Sunday. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you send your Son, Jesus Christ, to be a light to those who live their lives in the darkness of sin and death. Thank you for the illumination of your love and forgiveness that Jesus made possible through his death and resurrection. Bless us with such a faith that those who see us will clearly know that we are children of the light. Gracious Lord, our only help in time of need, mercifully look upon the needs of your servants, Lyle, Jim, and Herb. Grant them strength and healing according to your good and gracious will for their lives. Enable them to trust in your goodness through this time of affliction and to find in you their source of peace and hope. Be with their family members during this time and grant to them an extra measure of faith and trust. Father, we thank you for the love that has called Katie Warmbier to your side in the heavenly mansions and calls us even now to rejoice in her victory. Grant to those who mourn the comfort of knowing that through the resurrection of your Son we are kept alive by your Spirit even in the midst of death. Take away the heaviness of our sorrow, fill us with renewed joy, and when our last hour has come, let us share in the peace of the undefeated life in Christ with Katie and with all of our departed loved ones forevermore. Lord of the Church, you have blessed our congregation with a Christian day school where our children can learn the skills needed for life in this world but more importantly, that they can learn about you and how to grow in their faith. We ask your blessing upon our school, our teachers, our students, and parents. Be with us and among us in all we do. Let the light of your love continually shine upon us through the, our study of your word, and may it shine through us in all that we say and do. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be in abide with you all.
here in God's house this day and invite you to shake a hand with someone near you. Wish them a good morning.